So, well, um, uh, uh, both Hillary and Hans are here. Uh, they are our uh, sponsors, but we wanted them also to let us know um, about their, the great work they're trying to do um, to set up a clinical trial, this time with a, a, a pharma product, a drug actually, uh, not a nutraceutical, um, this time for gain of function, uh, for kids with gain of function. I know that your, your trial will start probably, hopefully, if uh, when we get it going, um, it would start on green 2B, but I know that you're gonna talk more about that. So um, with no further ado, I'll, I'll let you take over. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, just give me a moment here to pull up our slides. And perfect. Okay. So uh, thank you, Sandra, so much and to all of um, Green to be Europe for the invitation today. We are so grateful to be here to have the opportunity to speak with all of you. Um, and we're just eager to share absolutely as, as much as we can today with, with all of you. So um, we can start with some introductions. Uh, as Sandra said, I am uh, Hilary Savoy. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Communications at Grin Therapeutics. And um, I come to this role uh, with a background as an advocate and a mom of an ultra rare child myself. Um, I've spent the last eight years working on um, founding and directing an organization called the Cute Syndrome Foundation, which focused on SCN8A epilepsy. And um, in that time spent a, a good deal of energy working with sponsors in that space and, and thinking a lot about how what we know as advocates and parents is so important for the drug development process. And I joined uh, Grand Therapeutics in September to kind of help uh, work work with the company to ensure that what we know within the Grin community can be uh, applied to what we're doing as a company. And um, I'm so, so happy to be here and, and working with, with Hans, who I'll let uh, provide a little bit of background on, on who he is and, and what he does. Thank you, Hillary. Um, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, everybody, for having us here. It's really an honor and a pleasure to to be with you today. Um, wish you a good afternoon and wish we were there with you in person but maybe, maybe next year. Uh, my name is Hans Christinger and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Grin Therapeutics. I'm, I'm based in New York area. Uh, we also have a team in Brussels, which, which we'll tell you about in a second. But, uh, you know, I, I also have a, another hat where I'm on the board of the KIF-1A Foundation. And, you know, it's, a, it's a, another similar um, syndrome with similar challenges. And, and we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out how do we take the good science that's happening out there in neuroscience and, and apply it to, to the community, uh, huge unmet needs. And, and how do we organize resources to bring a care or a cure in a time frame that, that matters? So that, that's another hat that I have um, in this journey. Um, I, I started at Grin in August, so about the same time as Hillary, and it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to be working with her. I come from a company called Ovid Therapeutics, where we spent a lot of time in Dravé and LGS. Um, Takeda is taking that program forward into pivotal studies as we speak, and, and we also did a lot of work in Angelman and uh, Fragile X, a couple of other syndromes. So I spent a lot of time trying to build out science-driven, patient-centered companies. Um, and, and, and most of the experience that I have leading to these uh, opportunities comes from working in larger companies, uh, Roche and, and Abbott as a couple of examples. And started out in the 90s on the science side, uh, doing x-ray crystallography, looked at the structure of vascular endothelial growth factor and things like that. But um, that's a, a quick bit of my background. And I don't know, do we go to the next slide on uh, the team? Yeah, here we are. Because I think, you know, it's, um, we, Grin Therapeutics is a relatively new company. It's um, one you may not have heard a lot about yet. Um, and, and like Hillary said, we, we really um, are grateful to be able to share with you our journey because it, it is very important that, um, we're transparent with you and you understand the kind of things that are important as we do things in moving towards the clinic and so that we do things that are meaningful. But I also want you to know that we've got a very good team behind us. 
So there, there are a couple of things. I, I've been in the industry for about 30 years, and I think this is the, the, the best and, and um, brightest and most fun team that, that I've had the opportunity to work with. So it's, it's, it's humbling, and I'm really grateful to be able to have my name up here with this team. And, you know, without going into too much detail, you know, there, there you see a number of MDs and PhDs up there. So really just a smart group of people, a passionate group of people. Pierre Andrea Muglia, you may have met before, really is the, the founder of this company and the driver for this company. As the, the scientific understanding of grin 2 b and grin disorders was coming to, um, to, to a better place of understanding, he saw the opportunity for the science that, that we'll talk about in a second. And it's his dedication and passion that really brought this all to fruition and brought this team together. And the other thing, you know, this team, when you look at the names up here, they just had an unbelievable track record of success for over decades, uh, doing the types of things that we're, we're setting out to do. And you'll also see the reference to Black, reference to Blackstone. So, you know, well-resourced organization as well. So I, I think those are the key points for this slide. Um, so, you know, as Hans said, we have uh, this amazing team that's uh, working on this extraordinary project. And we really wanted to be here today to share some of that knowledge with all of you to um, essentially provide, our goals today are to provide updates on our program status, to give you also just some general background as a community on clinical trials, how they work and how they work uh, a little bit differently in rare diseases and share the, the efforts that are underway with our team and really uh, share with you the, the efforts that, that you have fed because we have been learning from your community uh, since the, the beginning from your advocates, from your caregivers, and we really wanted to be able to share back with you some of the results of that. And to open a transparent dialogue, we Hans and I and the whole team are really dedicated to the notion that that this this is a back and forth. We should be we should be sharing information, we should be engaged in conversation, and uh, we want to make sure that we keep the bar low for that. Um, Hans, do you have anything to, to add? Yeah, I would just say that, you know, as we walk through the slides, um, you know, we're, we're getting ready for the first trial. And you'll see that I, the, you'll see the reason I said first trial. Um, first site could be up and running this summer and the rest will be coming in the fall. And so we really want to share where we are, the types of things that we're thinking through and, and the types of things that we have to work through in in bringing a potential medicine through to make sure it's safe and, and we've got the right, um, looking at the right measurements to show that it actually works. So it, it's about that transparency that Hillary mentioned. And I think there are kind of two themes that you'll see as we talk through today. One is really just making sure that we are thinking about what to measure in the right way that's relevant and specific for you and, and that we're not just applying something that we've tried somewhere else and making sure it works. So that's one key point. And, and then the other is, as we are starting this first trial, um, it's, it's not a huge trial. We, we want to do it quickly. And, and that means it's important to also pick the right sites. So those are a couple of things that um, you'll see us talk through. But I'll, I'll pass it back. Hilary, I, I can talk forever. So. <laughs> This is this is essentially Hans and my favorite topic. So uh, we are we always are happy to be uh, sharing sharing these <laughs> these pieces of information with all of you. We spend a lot of time having these conversations. Um, so Hans, yeah, I think maybe we can dive into a little bit of background on Rodipril. Okay. So in the next slide, I think we'll have a video about clinical trials, and you know our first trial. Well, Rodipril, first of all. Um, thanks to Dr. Ramsey, I think we don't need to go into a lot of the science. You know, you, you've got a gene called grin 2 b which ultimately results in NR2B, a protein called NR2B that um, is responsible for the excitatory pathway in the brain. And, you know, we're looking at a variant in that protein that, that causes something that we want to modulate. 
So in the case of gain of function, we have an overactive NMDA receptor, we have an overactive GRIN2B. GRIN2B is, one, is part of that NMDA receptor as we talked about in the last discussion. And so rediprodil is highly selective. It, it binds to that portion of the NMD, NMDA. So the GRIN2 piece, which is encoded by uh, the NR2B piece, which is encoded by GRIN2B. And so our small molecule uh, binds specifically to that subunit, to that protein, and it dampens the expression. So we hope to, we hope to modulate and normalize the activity of that receptor. That's, that's what the molecule is designed to do. And we've, we come at it with actually, it's been tested for safety, however, in adults. It's been tested in uh, infants for infantile spasms, so three infants, um, it was used safely there. So there's a reasonable track record that we're building from, that we understand. And we've also done a good number of preclinical models. You, you can, you saw some of those examples in the last presentation. Uh, where we've, so, we've shown anti-seizure effects in those models. And uh, we've shown that we've been able to do what we hypothesized, which was with, with, which what I started with normalizing gain of function in some preclinical models. Uh, and so, you know, we, we hope that by doing this, we can um, demonstrate that uh, we've got a safe and effective molecule that uh, we, we know where, when, and how to use it. Uh, so that, that's a little bit of background about rediprodol. And I think what's important, and it's very it's wonderful to have had Dr. Ramsey speak ahead of us, because I think what, what's really important here is to understand that we are, we're not going as far back to the source of the problem as what Dr. Ramsey was talking about, but by acting directly on that subunit that's encoded by GRIN2B, um, we're, we really hope that going right to the source of the problem may have an effect on a host of symptoms that, that, that stem from, from that initial problem. Um, I think though, if we can take a step back now that we've introduced our team and, and kind of given a sense of what Rediprodil is and what it does, I, we recognize that as a community, you haven't had a ton of experience with clinical trials and certainly L-serine is the exception there. But um, we, we wanted to share with you a video that we've developed that just kind of walks through how clinical trials work and why the way that they work is a little bit different in a community like uh, the Grin disorders. So hopefully in the next slide, I can make this play. <laughs> um, I feel like video is always a little, uh, little touch and go, but let's see if this works. Oh, you can still see, eh? Let's try. Clinical trials play an important role in the development of new treatments. They allow scientists to determine if a new approach is safe, effective, and offers better results than existing therapies. Typically, clinical trials are made up of three phases, one, two, and three. Treatments move from one phase to the next if they're successful. In each subsequent phase, the number of patients involved gets larger, and the study design is modified in order to help answer different questions about safety, efficacy, and any side effects. For very rare conditions, clinical trials can be different, involving fewer patients, allowing for the combination of trial phases requiring close collaboration with the caregiver community. Every trial involves inclusion and exclusion criteria, specific requirements to be allowed into a trial. These can include age as well as disease characteristics. The purpose is to ensure that the results obtained are as valid as possible. While a trial may help your child, they're also conducted for the benefit of the wider community. We are pleased to be working in collaboration with key leaders from the GRIN community. And while the path to clinical trials is complex, we see you as the most important partners in the journey towards the first clinical trials for GRIN2B related disorders. Let's see if I can get back into presentation mode. Sorry about that. The video kicked kicked us out here. 
Well, I think we might be stuck in this way. <laughs> Let's see. Let me try one more time. Um, there we go. Okay. So um, I think Hans, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, how the, our primary objectives kind of fit into uh, what we just saw in that video. Yeah, thanks, Hillary. So again, this is the first trial. Um, and what we hope to do is build on the experience that we have with this molecule and show that it is safe and tolerable in grim 2 b patients. That's, that's primary objective number one. And we know uh, a lot about which dose range to start. And, and we've got a good theory and a good model for how to uh, administer the medicine, uh, the potential medicine. And so we also want to use that to va validate our, or confirm our hypothesis, our thinking from, from our previous experience. So there's a dosing strategy within the first trial as well. And we, and in this, we will see the range of where we actually want to be safe and tolerable. Uh, so there is a a very um, well thought through process to uh, you know slowly uh, find the right dose uh, so it's safe and, and using best practices to make sure that we're doing that well. And while we're doing that, you can also look for uh, secondary endpoints or secondary objectives, which is to see, you know, are you in this process also seeing that you've got a difference in seizure burden or behavioral symptoms or other things that are important for you. And uh, so in a way, you're combining the first two trials of what we saw in a normal clinical trial setting. And this is where I think it's really important to make sure that there's an open dialogue about the types of things that we're measuring. Uh, seizures are things that regulators and clinicians are used to measuring. And then there are behavioral symptoms that uh, there are certain scales and measurements, but it's really important to measure things that are relevant for you and not just things that are relevant for other, other communities. So maybe I'll pause there and see, Hillary, is that, uh, did I cover it or you have, yeah. how, please, please add to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the important pieces with the, the primary objectives uh, that, we're, that we're looking at is that while ridipradil has been in patient populations, including infants, this is the first time that we would be have, administering ridipradil to a, a GRIN 2B population. And so we really want to be certain that our dosing strategy makes sense. So we are looking at a very personalized, individualized process for uh, dosing each patient that would be in the trial. And um, this means perhaps some extra steps, but we really want to be sure that we understand how Ridipradil is working in all of all of the patients that enroll. And I think again, just the you know we have sort of early um, positive feedback from regulators that encourage us to move forward in this way where we're looking not only at at safety but also at, at efficacy, right? Looking to see whether we can start to understand how Ridipradil could impact, as Hans said, seizure burden, behavioral symptoms, and other symptoms that are associated with grin 2 b um, So I think this is important to, we saw in the video that every trial has inclusion and exclusion criteria, and they, they help us understand better how a, a particular treatment works by defining the patient population very carefully. So um, we wanted to take the step to share with you some of the, the inclusion criteria that we are considering for this, for this trial so that you have an understanding of uh, the population that, that we're looking at. So we have kind of three categories that we're sharing today. There's the age-based category. So looking at six months to 12 years of age. A genetic profile that's a confirmed GRIN2B genetic variant, as well as uh, that particular variant being a confirmed gain of function uh, because of the way the mechanism of action works for Dipperdil. And then a clinical profile, and this is the part I really wanted to highlight for this conversation today, is that we are looking at, as, as Hans said, it's a small study to start, it's a small group of people for the first study, 
but we are not only looking at individuals with seizures. So we have a subgroup of the population that will need to have at least one observable seizure per week. And then as a result of what we learned from you as a community, we are also looking at enrolling children who have only, um, meaning no seizures, but significant behavioral symptoms so that we can explore the effect of Ritipadil on those behavioral symptoms. And you know what we learned from this with this trial will set us up for the next trial, which we hope to roll into rather quickly. Uh, so that next trial should be confirming what we learned here. We should make sure that we've refined the types of measurements and things like that, so that we're continuing to build on it, um, build through success. And then we've got the possibility also to go broader where it makes sense, where it's scientifically. There's a scientific rationale. We've generated data to go beyond GRIN 2B, for example, and beyond it, 12 years old as well. So, you know, again, it's a first trial, and we're already thinking through what that next trial would look like. But what we're trying to do is be very clear about the types of things we're thinking about today so that we can start to set our baseline and look at what we're measuring and continue to build for success. And I think it's very important that we, we, share with you the, the, the places that we're, where our minds are going for, for next steps so that you can be prepared as a community. And you know we don't wanna raise expectations, but we also wanna be sure that you all understand what, what we're thinking about. And the behavioral piece, I think Hans, it's, it's important to explain how much the stories of, of you know, families in your community who've been willing to share their stories with us have affected the way that we think about this, this first trial. Um, and the stories of some of the behavioral challenges that you all face have really um, resonated with our team and are very much a part of our, our regular conversations as, as we make plans. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, Hans, maybe you can speak a, a little bit about uh, the complexity here that, that this, this graphic is uh, trying to explain about actually getting to the point of knowing whether or not we have a confirmed phenofunction. function. Yeah, and I, I always like to start with simplicity rather than complexity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we recognize on the last slide that um, there's the gain of, there's the uh, known GRIN2B variant that's important, but then there's also known characterization of that gain of function. And, and it isn't clear to me how well known that that characterization is. So we put this slide in to say, look, we, we, we're we here to try to make sure that we're um, increasing the knowledge, the scientific awareness, as well as uh, trying to help move, move this potential medicine through. So we do, we've thought, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we uh, make sure that there's a good understanding and characterization of, you know, what is going to be, what is gain of function? And, um, you know, how can we invest to make sure that that's, that's pretty well known? And so we do have a system with a number of um, very, you know, leading academicians, I'm sure everybody has, has in the community knows each other, but, you know, you start with a gain of function, a known grin to be variant list, usually in the public domain. And we've got a network of folks who are uh, conducting further analyses to, to characterize the gain, the, the variants to identify, are they gain of function? Are they loss of function? Um, further, if it's not known, do we do we believe that there's a potential benefit by applying radipradil? What do we know from in vitro tests or or non-human testing that says if we don't know if it's gain of function, will it make sense to or is it a problem to enroll a person? Um, but you know this is this is actually really all about trying to be helpful and 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 understanding the characterization of um, gain of function, loss of function, complex. And so we do have a system and we've got at the bottom uh, of this, you know, just what is known today. So what, what are our assumptions as we go into this? And, you know, what can we do to contribute to the general scientific understanding of what does it mean to, to have a gain of function or loss of function? 
And I, th I think one of the important pieces here for families to understand is that, um, first of all, when you're entering your data into various research databases, registries, um, when you, you know, are seen at your clinical site, these are all opportunities for your particular variants to have been shared, you know, not de in a de-identified manner, but with researchers in the space in order to know that this is a variant that needs to be analyzed. And um, I think it's also important to note that although we're looking for gain of function uh, variants for enrollment in this particular trial, it's our, our hope is to help advance knowledge on, on all of the variants in this space and improve access to understanding um, and scientific knowledge in the space. And we really want to be good community members in, in helping in whatever way we can to, to improve the quality of knowledge in this space. And I think I saw a question pop up about gain of function animal models. And I, I would say that today there is not a validated gain of function um, animal model. There are a number of, we're, we're building on about at least 10 years of um, testing in, in a number of different kind of models that, that test this pathway and how it works. Uh, we are in close contact and collaboration with a number of people who are uh, establishing gain of function animal models for green to be but uh, that that is one that it, it's still being developed is probably the short answer but and Hillary any comment on that uh, no I think um, I guess the only other piece I would say coming back to the characterization is just that you know we are supporting efforts, to ensure that all of the knowledge that's that's attained through this process is absolutely in the public domain. So this is not something that um, that we're pursuing for our for just for us, right? We're trying to make sure that whatever is learned about uh, grin disorders and, and grin two B in particular is shared in the public domain and improves the quality of research understanding, clinical understanding, and frankly, day to day life understanding of of your community and your children. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the agreements call for this to be published and published immediately. So um, there's, there's nothing proprietary in, in yeah. this setup. Yeah. Um, so I think we can move on and talk a little bit about um, sites. <laughs> um, Hans, maybe you can give a little bit of flavor for how um, how we think about sites as we as we are having conversations as a as a as a company. Sure. Yeah. So you know, again, this is the first trial, and it should lead to an expanded trial, and hopefully that next trial starts next year, um, depending on how quickly we can get up, set up and running. But you you have to start somewhere, and so the the first trial is not going to be very large. Uh, we've got sites in the U.S. and Europe as, as a start, and we start to think about how can we uh, quickly look at hospitals and clinics that have the necessary capabilities, um, they have the, the, the right uh, interest and motivation, and, and you also can put those in places where you can, you can go quickly. They're easy access for, for families, right? And uh, so it, it's always a difficult selection. You know, you, you can't in the first trial go everywhere. Um, that would be very expensive. It would, would impact the quality of the data potentially. So you, you kind of have to start with this tip of the spear with what are the short list handful of countries and sites where you start that will enable you to then go to a next trial and add more. But, but we look at uh, who are the, the key physicians that we're working with, um, are they and their staff and, and facilities uh, certified and, and able to, to implement and, and in a time frame that is, is appropriate? And, um, and then how does that match with ease of access for, for families? So th those are some of the things that we try to be very transparent. Um, you know, these aren't answers. These are, this is our current thinking. And if there's something else we should think about, we'll certainly take it under, uh, 
under advisement. And, and then there's always a, a question of now versus tomorrow. So generating the data to be able to go into the next trial um, is kind of the, the thinking, but uh, maybe I'll stop there, Hillary. Yeah, I think it's important for families to know. So what you see here on this map is the uh, Grin2B Foundation, their heat map. So all of those red dots are, are all, of, all of you who decided to put your information into that um, Grin2B Foundation map. So we used it just as an example that, you know, there's a, there's no reason that the distribution of patients isn't entirely even, um, but we only can go where we where we know that there are patients. And so I think as a as a sort of putting my my mother hat and my advocate hat on for a moment, this is one of the the ways that I think all of you as as parents, if you're interested in clinical trials, if you're interested in um, you know understanding what the the state of the art for treatments is one of the ways that, that you can best position yourself is to make sure that your advocacy organizations, are, you're well connected with them so they know who you are and where you are, so that, that you're well connected with your clinicians and they understand uh, what, what your current thinking is on, on these um, on potential new treatments. And then it certainly helps anyone in the space who might be considering trials, either ourselves or you know down the line for, for subsequent trials to, Place, place sites in, in intelligent ways so that they are convenient to you and, and meet all of your needs as a community. Um, so I think that's really kind of one of the things that I'd, I hoped we could uh, share with you today. And as Han said, this is our current thinking. Um, some of this is a, is a moving target, both for the first trial, but then certainly for subsequent trials as we cite further sites. Hans, do you have anything else to, to add to this, this picture? Sure. You know, I would just make a general comment that, you know, if there's follow-up questions, we're, we're going through a lot pretty quickly, but, um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out to Hillary um, at any time, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're always eager to hear from you and have, um, I think it's something that when I worked in the SCNAD space, I always said to the, our families, I, I think as parents, we underestimate how important our input is sometimes. And I just really wanna drive home that every single one of your stories, every single interaction that we've had with uh, advocates and caregivers in this space has been incredibly meaningful at all levels of our team. So I really wanna drive that home. So to that end, I think we can, we can uh, just give a little bit of a color for what's next what our next steps look like. Uh, we're in the process of uh, dealing with various governing regulatory bodies to um, get all of the authorization to proceed with the clinical trial. We're working um, diligently with uh, all of our partners who actually create the drug product and then ship it and make sure it, it is at all of the sites in time for the trial. And um, we are working very closely with site physicians and nurses and staff to make sure that they understand the requirements of the trial, that they provide feedback and um, that they are in touch with you know, potential patients. And then I think the part that, that is uh, very close to Hans and my heart certainly and, and is important to highlight here today is planning a really family friendly study experience. So we have concierge services that will help with travel arrangements and um, making sure that our patient documents are uh, as, as helpful as they possibly can be and setting up uh, home nursing services to help with trial involvement. And all of that, um, are the, all of those are, are places where we're also seeking feedback from advocates in the space to make sure that the documents make sense, that they work for you, that the services that we're putting in place are what you will need as a as a community. Hans, do you have any any other uh, color to add to that? No, I, I would just say, look, we, we recognize that uh, there are certain rigid things that we need to do in order to satisfy the scientific rigor, to satisfy the regulatory authorities. And sometimes those aren't the most fun for, for those going through the process. So, you know, part of over trying to be very communicative is so that we, we really hope that 
not only are we able to demonstrate that this is a, a potentially good medicine, we want to continue to build on the science and, and make sure that no matter what, we're, we're moving the understanding forward. And, and two, we just, and, and the other point is, we just really want to make sure that, um, you know, we understand that not all of this is, is easy or fun, but if we do it together, we can make it, um, we can make it a really worthwhile experience. And, 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 you know, so, you know, where we say family friendly, it sounds funny with a clinical trial, but we really are trying to make sure that it's, it's as convenient as possible that, you know, if there's a burden, we do everything we can to share that and make it as easy as possible to, to go through it. So leave it at that. Absolutely. Um, and with that, I think, I, I know we're, we're a little pressed for time. So I think we can move our, our questions over to the round table if that's, uh, Sandra, is that the best? Yeah, yeah. I think Julian. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yes, Hans and Hillary, thank you very much. First of all, of course, for sponsoring us and making this uh, this whole conference uh, possible. Uh, and secondly, for this very important uh, presentation. I know, of course, for the love kids, there is the El Serene, but for, for gain, there wasn't that much, just the main and team that didn't always work so well. So I think parents are very happy and very um, excited about this possibility with uh, with Roger Cordial. So thank you very much about uh, informing us about it and also giving more insight in how the trial will be and has to be set up. Mm -hmm.